Good morning, church. Where are you? (laughs) I'm going to say hello because it seems like most of the church is at home today. Guess the cold weather. Um, But uh, welcome. Welcome to the house of the Lord. I hope it is well with your souls today. Um, Just some quick reminders that the the youth group are still collecting uh, sponsorships for the 30-hour famine. So uh, uh, corral one of them up and ask them how you can give them money. The, wor- the, the, the money that they collect goes to help feed hungry children around the world and to raise awareness for uh, hunger in the world. Uh, they'll be ending the fast on February 13th with a Super Bowl lunch that we are all invited to. So hope you'll mark that down on your calendars. Also a reminder, we're still collecting Legos, board games, card games for the uh, Dwell Orphan Care. Um, Good and Plenty Meal on February 2nd. Chicken and Biscuits. So it's going to start at 3.30. And I need to let you know if you attend or were thinking about attending my Tuesday morning Bible study, it's canceled this week. Uh, I forgot I have an all-day session, Zoom session with the bishops. So (laughs) I would rather be with you. (laughs) Um, Also, one other correction. In the bulletin, it says that the the Red Cross blood drive on the 25th, it says it's Thursday the 25th, but that is actually Tuesday, Tuesday the 25th. So just if you take a pencil and make that correction for that. Um, Other than that, who would like to start worship? Oh, come on, more hands, please. (laughs) All right, let us begin worship in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.
please stand and join in the choral call to worship. <laughs> Please join in the opening prayer of the day. O God, our resurrection and life, the promise of our new life in Christ is like the delight of a cup of cold water in a dry and thirsty land. We gather as a family of believers and as those who honestly seek your truth. Bless our worship this hour. And now let us continue our conversation with our God in the silence of our hearts, 
sharing our joys, our sorrows, our supplications, our praise for answered prayers. Amen. We know that what we share with God in private will be answered in his good time and in his good way. We are so thankful, Lord, that you call us to be your people, that you call us to be your church, your body, your witness here on earth. We are grateful that we are called to serve. Let us seek out new opportunities to reach out and to serve others. We give thanks to you in all our days, but most of all, we give thanks for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time in our service, we have the opportunity to dwell upon <clears throat> what we have been given, what we've been blessed with in this life. And to know that we have the joy of sharing a portion of that, that we can give our time, our talents, our energy, our worldly goods, we can give those to our God for the service of his church, both on, his, on this earth and in the world to come. <laughs>
please join me in the prayer of dedication. Gracious God, I dedicate these gifts to your kingdom work and my life to you as a living sacrifice, bringing all my actions under the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, come and fill your temple. Amen. Prepare to come to the Lord in prayer. I pray that you will open your heart to him and to help us to open up, to soften up. Let us sing our prayer hymn. Gracious God, as we come before you, we give you thanks for all the blessings that you bestow upon us each and every day. May we be truly aware of, of your presence in the commonality all around us. But Lord, we also give you praise for being with us in, in our down times, in the times when we feel discouraged, when we feel like everything we do is just like beating our heads against a wall. Lord, it is in those times that we pray that you would reveal yourself to us, that we might get a glimpse of, of your kingdom being built, that we would be encouraged to continue on. But if you choose to, to keep that back from us, then, Lord, may our faith be stronger and persevere. Lord, we also pray this morning that you would be with all who are hurting, no matter what their, their hurt may be, Lord, we pray that you would pour your healing oil upon them. This morning, we particularly pray for Lucy and Dick Buck, and we pray that you would bring 
order and peace and direction into their lives. We pray your continual presence in the healing of Joe Hutchison. We Lord, Lord, we pray that you would be with Wayne and Anna and Doherty and, and continue to heal them, make them stronger. We pray for Monica Hill and, and all, Lord, who may be in the hospital with COVID or quarantined with COVID, Lord, we pray for those who, who battle diseases and it feels like they just can't overcome, but we pray for them. We pray your strength upon them and that your Holy Spirit would infuse their bodies and eradicate whatever it is that may be holding them back. Lord, you are our God and you are amazing. May we always remember that and put our faith and trust in, in what you can do and in the story that, that we continue to live out that's been playing out since the beginning of time. Help us to trust in you. Lord, we pray also for one another, for we know our own troubles, and therefore we know that those around us have troubles as well. And we pray that you would meet each of us where we are, and we pray for your church. Continue to bless us. Bless our children's ministry as it continues to grow. Bless our membership as it continues to grow. Lord, help us to, to be the salt of the earth, that, that as we go into your community, that they can taste and see that you are good. And Lord, for those who seem to be in the dark, may your light shine from us and guide them into a better way. Lord, these and many other things we give up to you in the name of Jesus, our healer and savior. Amen. Every day I wake to find that God's been faithful In all the ways I knew He would be And I don't know how some people live without Him Because I know what Jesus means to me I can trust Him, I can trust Him, for my God's at work in all things that I need. He is able and unchanging, He's the hope that still surrounds me faithfully. I can trust Him. I have walked into a room so full of sorrow and saw the desperate faces of the crowd and they looked at me through eyes so full of pity but joyous faith, I sing these words out loud. I can trust Him, I can trust Him, for my God's at work in all things that I need. He is able and unchanging. He's the still surrounds me faithfully. I can trust Him. No storm He cannot weather, no sin He can't undo, no sickness He can't conquer, no mountain He
please join me in the prayer of illumination. Holy and gracious God, may your Holy Spirit impart to us your wisdom and revelation so that with the eyes of our hearts enlightened, we may know the hope to which Christ has called us, the richness of his glorious inheritance among us, and the greatness of his power for those who believe. Amen. A reading from John. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This is he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. And from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. When Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me the proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in, his, in, a, in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up for three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to the widow at Zarephath and Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove them out of town, and led them up to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through them, in the midst of them and went on his way. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. As many of you know, that before I accepted my call to ministry, I was a landscape architect. I had five years of education in landscaping at Penn State, and after graduating, I started my own design business. For 10 years, people paid me for my work, my designs, and my advice. One day, my, my dad came to me and he said one of his ash trees in his front yard wasn't doing well because of where it was located. And, and this is about 40 feet tall. And he, he wanted to know what my advice was. And so I, I drew upon five years of 
college education and 10 years in the business, and I told him what to do. You know what he did? He took one of his bulldozers, pushed the thing over, dug a hole, and plopped it in it. And then he couldn't figure out why it didn't make it. No prophet is accepted in his hometown. Being an Eagle Scout a few years back, I was asked by some close friends from our, our, my home church to be the guest speaker at, at their son's Eagle ceremony in the church. And knowing that scouting is founded on Christian ideals and that most of the people attending would be Christians, I, I, my, my message was probably more like a Boy Scout sermon. But it was received very well. People liked it. And after the service, one of the older members came up to me, and she had been a member of the church probably well, since the time of Moses. <laughs> and she said, I don't remember anything you just said, but I remember when you used to soap my windows and corn my house on Halloween. <laughs> she she didn't hear anything I said. She couldn't see the man that stood before her. She couldn't see the, the preacher in me. All she could see was a mop-haired, skinny kid who terrorized the neighborhood one night a, week, a year with a bar of soap and a handful of corn because no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I'd like you to keep those stories in mind as we discuss today's text which is recorded by all four gospel writers, and I'm going to draw on information from each to give us a fuller picture. Luke places this story right after Jesus emerges from spending 40 days being tempted by Satan in the desert or in the wilderness. However, he begins this part of the story by saying news about him had spread throughout the whole countryside, indicating that Jesus didn't just come out of the wilderness and go home to Nazareth. If you read John, John tells us that after Jesus' baptism in wilderness time, he called his disciples. Jesus attended a wedding in Cana and performed his first miracle. He performed miracles during Passover in Jerusalem. He chased out the money changers for the first time in the temple. He met with Nicodemus in the night and he conversed with a woman at the well. Mark says that he traveled, as he traveled home, that he calmed the sea as easily as taking a boiling pot of water off the stove. He healed a man or a woman who had been bleeding for 10 years, drove out a demon and healed a man's shriveling hand. Yeah, up to this point, Jesus, he had the hot hand. Things were going pretty well for him. And so as Luke says, News about him spread. So now Jesus rolls up to his old stomping grounds, his hometown of Nazareth. It's Friday night at the synagogue. Now, I don't know what you consider a good time on Friday night, but on Nazareth, it was in the synagogue. And the place is packed. Parking attendants ran out of spaces or parking donkeys in the grass. Church secretaries are running around making, you know, running off more bulletins. The aisles are packed. Everyone was in town. They wanted to see the hometown boy who was making it good. So many of the, so many of the faces were familiar to him. The young ones were his childhood friends who he skipped stones with. And the older ones were their fathers, now showing gray in their beards. After a prayer... A couple of the psalms were sang, a few other people read, and then they handed the guest of honor the scroll of Isaiah and said, choose whatever you want to read. And Jesus chose Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, because he was about to reveal to the people who knew him best who his true identity and what his mission was. Jesus read, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because... He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captive and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus rolled up the scroll and there was a long silence as every ear was anxiously awaited to hear what, what marvelous insights that Jesus would, would reveal to them. 
And then he says, today these words are fulfilled in your hearing. And that was it. And the people were dumbfounded. Some were surprised and delighted. They began murmuring among themselves saying, this is Jesus. He's our Jesus. And he just told us that the day of delivery is here. Soon the Romans will be out. We'll be free. Hallelujah. But others heard something else. Um, he just said in not so many words that he's the Messiah. Some rejoiced and wondered, where did he get so wise? And others asked, where do you get these ideas? Isn't this Joseph's son? He's just a kid from Nazareth. You know, the kid who grazed our goats and ran through our gardens? There's nothing special about him. Now, Jesus could tell from the looks on their faces, their furrowed brows, the scratching of heads, that they were having some doubts about what he said. And so before they could ask, he says, go ahead, say it. Come on, you know you want to, so say it. Say to me, physician, heal yourself. You all heard that I've been doing these miracles in Capernaum. Now you want me to do them for you, right? But Jesus wasn't about to do a dog and pony show because he knew their hearts, hearts that were more entitled than they were filled with compassion. Jesus tells them, no, right hand on the scrolls, I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his hometown, meaning that he wasn't going to do any miracles because they didn't have enough faith in him. And then he goes on to teach that this, this was true in the days of Elijah and Elisha as well. He recalls a time when Israel was under um, divine judgment for worshiping other gods and the land was consumed by three and a half years of drought. And there were widows all over the land of Israel and they needed help. And Elijah tried to give it to them but they didn't believe. And so God sends Elijah to a foreign city, a Gentile city of Zarephath, where he is led to a woman who with her son were starving to death. And he asked her for some food, and she, she tells him, all we have is a little bit to make a small meal for ourselves, and then we're going to die. But for God's prophet, I will give it to you. And then God miraculously made her flour and oil ever flowing. It didn't run out. She may have been a Gentile, but unlike God's people, she recognized God's prophet and she believed. He then reminds them of Elijah's disciple Elisha, who, who healed a Gentile army commander, Naaman, of leprosy. Now there is leprosy all throughout Israel, but none of them were healed. But he had to go to the Syrian. Elisha had to go to a Syrian, Naaman. And like the widow, Naaman recognized God's prophet and believed. Jesus was just pouring hot coals on their heads at this time, recalling famous episodes in their history where God's prophet had to go to pagan people in order to find enough faith to perform miracles. And in saying this, Jesus was telling those present I don't see any true faith in this room either. You're more interested in doing religion than you are in showing mercy and, and fighting for justice for the oppressed. You're, you're substituting doing religion for doing God's will. And the people, they took offense at that. They became angry. Can you imagine? <laughs> when I was in seminary, I had to do a research paper on an evangelist, and I chose Billy Sunday. I don't know how many of you know Billy Sunday. He was a professional baseball player turned evangelist in the early 1900s. And one day as he preached in a particular city, he made a few critical comments about the city's poor labor conditions. And after the service, some of the businessmen sent him a message that said, Billy, leave the labor matters alone. Concentrate on saving people Stay out of the political issues. You're rubbing the fur the wrong way. To which Billy wrote back, if I'm rubbing the fur the wrong way, then tell the cats to turn around. <laughs> Jesus was rubbing the fur the wrong way. But the cats didn't turn around. They arched their back and they unsheathed their claws. And, and they, 
they took him up to the top of a cliff where they were going to throw him off and kill him. But why did they find Jesus' comments so offensive that they would resort to murder? Well, first of all, just human pride. You know, he just accused us of not having enough faith. Who does he think he is? Oh, yeah, that's right, the Messiah. But the second thing that offended them was that they couldn't believe that little Jesus could actually be a prophet, much less the Messiah. I mean, come on. He delivered our papers. He, he watered our donkeys. For crying out loud, we rubbed his, his, his snotty nose. The Messiah? No way. Not little Jesus. Besides, God wouldn't come in such ordinary and common ways, would he? When it comes right down to it, what the people that day were really offended by was the incarnation, the idea of the incarnation. The word became flesh, that God actually became a human being and one that they knew. But I want you to think about it. Most of you here know T.J. McCabe, okay? You know, little T.J.? <laughs> you know, raised in this church, baptized in this church. I mean, some of you taught little T.J. the old, old stories in Sunday school. He participated in vacation Bible school and youth, and he sang in your youth choirs and things. And then he, he went off to college and got an education, went to seminary, and is now pursuing ordination. He serves one of our churches in our conference. But imagine upon being ordained, one Sunday, little TJ visits your church as a guest preacher, and he stands up here and he says, I'm here to let you know I am the Messiah. I've returned. What are you going to do? Are you going to say hallelujah and bow down and praise him? Or are you going to shake your head and say, man, something's messed up up there. <laughs> what are you going to do? But that's what was going on in Nazareth. The local kid, like TJ, comes back to church and claims to be the Messiah. And the people, they, they found it offensive because everyone knows that the Messiah will be successful. He'll be powerful. He'll command authority. But we know this kid. There's no way he's the Messiah. Ha <laughs> ha, good one, good one, Jesus. Now knock it off because you're insulting our intelligence. Now, they could believe that God was the creator of everything they saw around them, that God could illuminate the moon or the stars and the, all the suns. They believed that God, they could experience God in a meaningful way through the beauty of a sunset, the majesty of the mountains. But to believe that God could reveal himself to us through a local altar boy, well, that's just pushing it too far. Too far. And that, my friends, is what was so offensive. God in human flesh of man, a man they knew, Jesus from Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? But there are things about our faith, things about God that offend us too, aren't there? We don't like to admit it, but there are things that cause us to stumble in our faith, things that sometimes make it difficult for us to believe, things like suffering. Why does a good and loving God allow it? Why do children get cancer and die? That, that in, upsets us and offends our senses. Jesus tells us you have to forgive and love everyone. And that includes your enemies and the people who hurt you the most. That offends us that he wants us to do that. For some, the exclusivity of the gospel, that there's only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ, is found offensive. For some, you know, the crucifixion and death. If he's supposed to be God and God dies, <clears throat> now, that offends me that you would even say that. For others, they find the doctrine of hell offensive. Oh, I believe in heaven. I don't want to hear anything about hell. But for many who don't accept Christianity, the greatest stumbling block is that God would lower himself 
to endure human birth of a poor Middle Eastern peasants, that he would grow up learning a lowly blue collar laborer's trade. And I'm not putting down carpentry. My, I have many people in my family. I'm saying some people see that though that way. And at least for God, he wouldn't do that. It's offensive to think that God could come in such a common manner. We can accept that God can spiritually interact with us. We can accept that he's the creator of all things. We accept that God can manifest himself in, the, in a cloud or a pillar of fire or a burning bush. But a human being? No. And why? Because God isn't supposed to be common, right? God is unique. God is holy. God is, well, God. But it's true. God is constantly revealing himself to us through common, ordinary things. Things like the rain or the sound of a stream, the warmth of sunlight, the cool of shade, the quiet of a snowfall, and yes, even other people. And that right there might offend us. It did the people of Jesus' day. Jesus told a parable about the judgment day, the separating of the sheep and the goats. And one group he praised for healing him and, and, or feeding him and clothing him and comforting him and visiting him. And the other he condemned for not doing those things. And both groups asked, Lord, when did we see you and do and not do these things? He said, when you have done these to the least of these, my brothers, then you've done it to me. And what they learned that day was that Jesus reveals himself. He speaks to us. He shows himself to us through other people, common people. For some, that's offensive to lower God to our level, or worse, that God would lower himself to our level. It's just so common and ordinary. Sometimes God comes to us so commonly that we don't recognize him. Like when he speaks to me through my wife. Oh, Lord, not her, please. She doesn't look like you. She doesn't sound like you. But God is constantly speaking to me, revealing himself to me through my wife. And the only thing worse when God reveals himself to you through your spouse is when he does it through one of your kids. And for example, and this is just off the top of my head. I have no personal experience with this. <laughs> when you're on the highway, traffic is bad. People are driving poorly and erratically. And you say, oh, I can't stand all these stupid people. Where did you learn to drive? Just get out of my way. A little voice from the back seat says, well, that wasn't very Christian. <laughs> <laughs> now, what was said was, well, that wasn't very Christian. But what I heard was, well, that wasn't very Christian. <laughs> God speaking to me, revealing himself through a common kid, my kid, I hate when he does that. <laughs> we find it offensive that God allows suffering, but maybe even more so when God reveals himself to us through suffering. As a pastor, I visit people in nursing homes and hospitals in their worst states. I remember visiting one parishioner when she was in the hospital on hospice care. She wasn't conscious and was struggling to breathe. And I said hello, but I couldn't, I wasn't sure that she could, you know, was even aware that I was present. However, I talked to her. I had 20 minutes to visit with her. And so I just started telling her what was happening in the church. But you know, after about five minutes when it's just one way, it just felt like there wasn't anything else to say. And so I prayed with her, and I was getting ready to leave, but I couldn't. Because as I looked at that 91-year-old woman in her last days, I saw beyond her face, and I saw God. And God said to me, stay with me. And so I pulled up a chair, and I leaned in, and I just said, 
I'm just going to sit with you for a while. Why does God do that? Why does God come to us in such ways? God seems so clear whenever we, we look at a sunset. We're like, oh, God. Or when we look at a night sky filled with stars. Wow, God. He seems so real when we, we read the stories about God in Scripture or when we experience His presence. However, when God reveals Himself through the common, we at best miss Him because we're looking for something unique, something grand and miraculous like a burning bush or waters to part or the sun to stand still. And at worst, we get offended Offended that God just doesn't seem so godly, right? That was the problem that day in Nazareth when Jesus, he was just too familiar, too common. If he had come like a superhero, strong and boisterous, if he had come as a king sitting on his throne and pushed Herod aside and took his up, up his rightful place, became as a conqueror leading an army of angels, oh, they would have bit hook, line, and sinker. But this was just Joseph's son, Jesus. The offense was so great that they decided the only way to deal with him was to take him up on top of a cliff and murder him. But miraculously, he slips past them because it wasn't his time. However, three years later, the time would be at hand and they would catch up with him and they would be even more offended with him. Friends, God is the Lord of all creation and I believe he speaks to us through every aspect of it. He, the warmth of the sun, the river, the tree, wildlife, music, and even other people, common people like you and me. He comes to us through words on a page. He comes to us through water and baptism. He comes to us through the staples of life, bread and juice and holy communion. None of those things are fancy. None of them are unique. But through faith, we can see and hear God through those common words, through water, through that bread, through other people. Why? Perhaps even my voice this morning. Or does that idea offend you? Choose this day whom you will serve. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for today. The time to gather and to hear this story. Lord, there's nothing fancy about it. It was just an everyday thing that happened. And yet... The message in those common everyday things was spectacular and enlightening. Lord, the people were looking for something amazing. The Magi were looking for a king in a palace. And yet you humbled yourself, being born like one of us, but yet even lower than us, for you were born in a stable. Your first bed was an animal's food trough. Lord, you grew up in a humble dwelling with learning a humble trade. And when you grew, you had nothing but the clothes on your back. And scripture tells us there is nothing about your physical appearance that would draw us to you. And it was probably on purpose, for you were just so common. And yet, the things that you did were so uncommon and spectacular. And that is what you want us to focus on. You want us to emulate you. You want us to, to do the things you did, not look like you, not talk like you, but to do the things you did. You call us to be the salt of the earth for our community, that, that they may taste and see that you are good. You call us to go forth into the dark places, that your light may shine, that we may, may draw them into your kindness and your goodness and your love and your kingdom. And so, Lord, help us.
this day, as we, we gather together and look in the face of our brothers and sisters to see you. Lord, as we gather and we go forth and we drive back home or wherever we're going, and we see the deer in the field or the hawk in the sky or the snow blanketing the earth, may we see you revealed in the common and may we give testimony to your greatness. This we ask in your holy, precious name. Amen. And now will you please stand and join us as we affirm the goodness, the greatness of God. Hail to the Lord's anointed. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with you. Go forth in peace, you common people, and lovingly serve one another. Amen? Amen. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. 